So, question. And so this gets to some of the top questions that people type into Google. And here it is. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? No. Where do, in the Bible does it say that Jesus is God? So some form of that question. Where does the Bible, does it say that Jesus is God? Why this question? So this, it ranks as one of the top like seven to ten questions that people ask theologically on Google according to, well, an article I read about Google searches in 2018. And why this question? Because this is a question that I think a lot of us just kind of assume. Like we grew up in the church or you grew up in North America and thinking Jesus is God is like a core statement of faith. So it's something that's so simplistic that we don't ever think to prove it. But it's a very, very, very important question. Because if Jesus is something other than God, if Jesus is something less than God, we are in a lot of trouble here. Because the Bible says again and again, only God whom you will worship and serve. And so if Jesus is not God, we are idolaters, and everything we do here is not only useless, but actually terribly offensive to God. So, where in the Bible does it say Jesus is God? Now, I'm trying to think of the person who's typing this question in. And I can think of one person who might be just honestly seeking an answer. There's another person who asks this question who might be maybe of a little bit of an atheistic bent. You know, I don't really believe in, in divine divinity, but I kind of like some of the things that Jesus says. There's a lot of people who like that. Like, you know, Jesus is a good teacher, but I don't really, I don't really get on board with all of the, with all of the kind of like religious stuff. And so, you know, maybe it doesn't really say Jesus is God in the Bible. After all, there's other people who deny this. And so we get to the 19th century cults. So we get to the, the Jehovah's Witnesses. We get to the two-by-twos. We get to the Mormons. And for some reason, in the same period of time, they all came up with the same idea that, that Jesus was something a little bit less than God. Now, this turns out to be, you know, very old her heresy. You go back to the Arianism in the third century, and people were claiming this as well. And then you can imagine this is a popular search because there is a whole religion that believes in Jesus, but does not believe that Jesus is God, which would be the Muslim faith, which te teaches that Jesus was a prophet, but not God. So let's answer this question. This sermon is kind of the equivalent of shooting fish in a barrel, taking candy from a baby, because this is something that's very easy to prove, and we're going to go through it. Sometimes it's good to just sit down, crawl, talk about the simple and things because these are important, especially if you ever get into a conversation with someone who might reject this, which there are people out there around town, <clears throat> we'll not name any names, I've already named some of them, that deny this truth. So first of all, where would we go? Oh, look, ha, huh, look at that. And it said, John 858. This is actually pops up if you type this in Google. Good job, Google. I'm impressed. <laughs> Verses that say that Jesus is God. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now this is an important text because not only does it call Jesus God, and we're going to find out if you go through, you keep reading, that the Word, what they identify as the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the Word identified as Jesus, that this Word was both with God, so in some way distinct, and was God which is where we kind of get the whole doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus is God, identified there is one God, and yet three persons equal in divinity. 
Now, if you've ever been in a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness, they would tell you, well, you know, this is a nice verse here, but you've got to read it in our translation. Because if you read it in our translation, it does not say Jesus was, that the word was God. It says the word was, if you know it, a God. Okay, I'm going to take like two minutes here. There's going to be some Greek words up on the screen, and I apologize for this already. But I'm going to explain it to you, and it's going to be Greek to you because it's literally Greek. But hopefully you can understand a little bit of it just to get like a glimpse that when they say that they translate it, the word was a God, that they're actually kind of like fools because they've taken a very like simple grammatical rule and missed all of the rest of the grammatical rules. It's like English, you know, you learn how sentences work and then you learn all the ways that they don't exactly work like this. It's the same with Greek. So, oh no, I forgot to load the, this is bad. So, sorry, this is not going to work. I forgot to load the fonts on that computer and I should have checked this, but I didn't. But if this this doesn't make any sense because it's like getting gobbledygook, which uh, it would say theos hein ha logos, which, uh, which would have made sense. But anyways, if, if I had done this right, I could have pointed this out. But anyways, the word for the word was God does not have the definite article, which makes it God. But this is actually a grammatical rule because it puts the article on what is the subject rather than the object of the sentence. And if you understood the predicate nominative, it would all work out. And none of this probably makes sense to you. Don't worry. We are not resting our entire case of Jesus' divinity on this verse. Continue reading in the book of John. In words you can understand, at the end, we get to the famous point where Thomas is doubting that Jesus really rose from the dead, which is why he gets the name Doubting Thomas forever. Thomas comes and says, then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Thomas, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And at this moment, like Jesus, when he is called God, he, he accepts this and does not turn him away because Jesus is God. Then we could go on and we keep reading in the Bible. Romans chapter 9, there's a lot of, hopefully you've read, there's a lot of important theology in Romans chapter 9, but you get to verse 5, to them, that is the Jewish people, belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who, the Christ, who is God. And not just like some like semi sort of like God thing, no, but God over all. So write that down. Romans chapter 9 verse 5. This is the verse that says just clearly out that Jesus is God over all. Blessed forever. Amen. You could just drop the mic and I could be done in like five minutes in my sermon. But we're going to keep going because there's a lot of other verses. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Our blessed hope that we wait every day to split the skies is not some lesser junior circuit semi-God, but God who is going to come on the white horse to bring judgment to those opposed to his rule and vindication for everyone who hopes in him is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. But of the Son, he says, this is of the Son, of Jesus the Son, your throne, O God. Not O King, not O Messiah, not O a God, but O God is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Jesus is God. Second Peter 1.1. 1, 1. To those who have obtained an equal, of a faith equal standing with ours. This is Peter saw Jesus in the flesh. Obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of 
by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes I find it hard to believe. It's like there's still people who are like... I am not convinced by all of this. I mean, you know, maybe you could read it. It's saying God, but does it mean like God, God, or like God, God? I'm like, yeah, you're using a lot of like humming and hawing there. But if you're not convinced, oh, wait, I'm just getting warmed up. (laughs) Maybe it's not calling Jesus God not identifying him with the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end, the one who dwells with immortality, invisible forever. Revelation 21, 13. This is the words of Jesus. It's written in red if you have a red letter Bible. A little while later, in verse 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. The beginning and the end. This is Jesus, who is God. So, since there are still people out there, and I hope if you're not convinced you're watching, there is more. Jesus, in the Gospels, and we pointed this out in Luke like numerous times, how it kind of nods to him being God. In the Gospels, We are shown how Jesus has all of the attributes of God. Now, we talk about the attributes of God. We get to like these weird words. They're omni-words, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, which are really weird words, but I'll show them up there so we learn the big words because it's fun to learn the big words. But I'll also tell you what they mean because if you're, you know, don't love big words, not everybody does. God is omnipotent. Now it says omni, which means all in Latin, I think. And then potent, which is powerful. So all powerful. So God is all powerful. And then in the gospels, when we see Jesus come and he said to them, why are you afraid? So this is when he's actually on the boat and he's on the boat. He's actually asleep. Jesus, you know, I I love how Jesus is just asleep. And this big storm comes up. The wave is rocking the boat. And the disciples are like freaking out, like, oh, we're going to die. They wake Jesus up. And Jesus is like, why are you afraid? Oh, you have little faith. Then he rose and he rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. And the ancient mind, when they thought about the sea, like the sea is often pictured as this like chaotic realm. It's unstructured. It's dangerous. Anyway, you see, they show these videos of, of these like luxury cl- cruise liners going to like Antarctica. And I, I saw this video like last week. And it's like, oh man, the sea is still a wild and chaotic place because there's just like the waves just like crunching over. You don't want to look up awesome videos like big freighters and big waves because it's just scary and awesome. But, but the, imagine going out into waves like that with like a 14-foot boat that leaks. <laughs> and this is the kind of boat the disciples are on. This is the kind of boat they went around the ancient world and a lot of people sunk and, and they just felt like this is just wild and chaotic. Who can control a wave? But Jesus can. And his disciples, they don't think, oh, wow, what a, what a prophet. What a mighty man has arisen. It's like, what man could possibly do this? And even more, and Jesus walks on the water literally walks on the water and kind of modeled. If you go back in, in Genesis, God hovers the whole, the God spirit hovers over the face of the waters in the same way. Jesus walks on the water. And when he does, he eventually gets into the boat, the whole thing with Peter, but we're not going to talk about that. They got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat this time, second time on the sea, 
They worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. They worshipped him. And we're going to talk about worship a little later, because that's, I think, the one thing that like really, really, really shows that Jesus is God, other than the other things that really show Jesus is God. <sighs> Shooting fish in a barrel. All right, so they worshipped him. He shows his omnipotent power. God is omnipotent. Jesus shows his omnipotence over creation. Jesus is God. God is eternal. And this gets to the passage that we read here today, and this is a great passage. And so the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, that's a fascinating statement for a couple of reasons. The first we'll get to. He doesn't say, before Abraham was, I was, which would be true, but saying something a little bit different. He's not saying that, like, he existed in some form way before Abraham as some sort of, as some people out there wildly claim, as some sort of less than God created being. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Which is a statement of like, time doesn't really have meaning for me because I am eternal. I am beyond time. And secondly, it's a little bit of a nod here to the fact that at the burning bush, when Moses goes to the burning bush and Moses asks God, the father, what his name, he said, I am who I am. And when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, they can recognize that that's weird grammar in English. It was weird grammar in the Hebrew dialect that they spoke. And they recognize what Jesus says there. And they can recognize that Jesus is claiming to be something beyond just being a man. Because they pick up stones to throw at him. They're not just saying, oh, you know, that's an interesting statement that you make. No, they recognize that he is claiming to be God. And in that statement, either, you know, they have two options. Either they pick up stones to stone him, which if he's a liar, that's what they would have had to do by Jewish law. Or, secondly, they have to fall down and worship him because God walks among them. God is eternal. God is eternal. The Jews answered him, this is a little later on, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you because for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Well, the people who were blinded to the truth about Jesus knew more than some people who, don't, who miss this fact that Jesus is God. God is eternal. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is God. God is next. God is omniscient. God is omniscient. And we think about Jesus, and Jesus was fully man, and I could spend a long time proving that, but I'm not going to here because obviously I have to get done this sermon at some point in time. Jesus is fully man, but and so he grew in wisdom and knowledge. He went and he read and he learned. And yet, at the same time, according to his divine nature, in some way, this hypostatic union, fully God, fully man, again, I'll put it all together, because above my pay grade, Jesus had knowledge beyond any person. So here it is. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who were, who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And even as Jesus called Judas, Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him in the end. Jesus, throughout his ministry, he just knows things. You know, man looks to the outside, God looks to the heart. Jesus looks to the heart of people. Jesus knows. God is omniscient. Jesus is omniscient. Jesus is God. God is omnipresent. Now, this is a little weird one. I was trying to, like, getting my brain wrapped around this was like... Uh, 
It was like a lamprey. Have you guys ever seen a lamprey? It's sort of like a chipmunk trying to like swallow a, a, an orange, getting my mind around this, because it just like didn't work. But anyways, Jesus says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now Jesus has a human body. It's a human body still at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And yet, according to his divine nature, he promises that when we gather in his name, and in the context here, it's about church discipline, but anyways, when we gather in his name, two or three together, that Jesus himself is there. This is the hope of glory, Christ in you. Now, this kind of Jesus presence everywhere is only possible as if he is God. He is omnipresent. God is omnipresent. Jesus is omnipresent. Jesus is God. God is also sovereign. The specific sense, we're going to talk about God in the be- being able to forgive sins. And he said to the paralytic, this is when the, the, this uh, man's friends, he's bedridden, he gets lowered through the roof to Jesus. Jesus looks at him and says, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes who are sitting there questioning in their hearts, he is blaspheming who can forgive sins but God, God alone. Not God and someone else, God alone. Jesus forgives sins, which is something that only God can do. And Jesus does it because Jesus is God. He's still like thinking like, man, how do people deny it? They still do. And we will still go on. God is immortal. (laughs) Jesus says, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. He's speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus is priest forever by the power of an indestructible life. Hebrews chapter seven says, although Jesus, according to his human nature, his body really did die. He was forsaken by sin to the cross, but death could not hold him because his divine nature could never die. God is immortal. Jesus is immortal. Jesus is God. And this gets to, you know, it gets a little like academic-y. Okay, we're like an argument, really like trying to prove this point. But, but it's so important because we stand here to worship Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ is something less than God, we are doing something very wrong. By Jesus' own words, Jesus answered him, answering the devil, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Jesus says there is one person and one person only you shall worship and that is the Lord your God. And in the Bible, we always have like, there's when angels show up, People like are falling down to worship and the angels say, rise up too, like I'm, I'm a servant of God. When Peter, Peter in the book of Acts, uh, Cornelius, he's like a, a God-fearing Gentile. He gets this vision, comes to Peter. And when he comes to Peter, in, it's this is in Acts chapter 10, he falls down at his feet and he worships him. And Peter at that moment says, stand up, stand up. I too am a man. If this is the thing, if someone today comes and falls down at your feet and worships you, you have to say, like, get up. If you don't say, get up, like, don't worship me, worship God, like, you are, you are the worst kind of devil to steal worship from God. And so we already saw Jesus, after he walked on water, they get in the boat and they worship him. At that moment, if he accepts that worship, there are two things. Either he's a devil or he's God. And he's God. Again, Matthew 28, at the end of the gospel, 
The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. And the next line, I don't know, I don't show it. It's not like, hey, get up, don't worship me. No, Jesus accepts the worship because Jesus is worthy of worship and praise, not because he's something less than God, but because he is God, because only God can be worshipped or else it is idolatry. Jesus, when he heals the blind man, Jesus said to him, you've seen him and is he who is speaking to you? He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus accepts people's worship. Either he is fully God in every sense of the term. Jesus is God or he's a devil. And I can't believe that Jesus is a devil. I must believe he's a God. God alone is worthy of worship. Jesus is worthy of worship. Jesus is God. So, summary. Looking it up, where in the Bible does it say that Jesus is God? And this is just a summary in canonical, or, canonical order. Isaiah 9, Matthew 8, 14, 18, 28, Mark 2, John 1, 2, 6, 8, 9, 10, 16, 20. You can really just read like the whole Gospel of John. It's all about that. Romans 9, Titus 9, Hebrews, Titus 9, that's not right. Strike that out. It's not Titus 9. It is Titus 2. Strike that. Titus 2.13, Hebrews 1, 2 Peter 1, Revelation 22. So, so what? If you think that Jesus is God, it is, it is good. Like the, the devils, like they're constantly like the demons, they would like, Ah, you're the son of God. Like they would fall down. Jesus would like hush them. It's only good to know this if we put it into the practice of worshiping him. This is what it's all about. It's all about worshiping Jesus Christ. Because just thinking that he's like, he's like a savior, thinking that, that he's good, like, like ultimately, Jesus Christ is seeking worshipers to come to him. And so he's welcoming that when we get into the boat of Christianity, we get into the boat. We don't just get into the boat because we're not going to drown anymore. They're like, oh, I don't like that drowning little bit, the whole like bit of hell and water and stuff. We get in the boat to worship Jesus Christ. Because it is him in which all our joy is found. And it is he alone that is worthy of worship. I find it, I find it just so remarkable that in the world where, like, literally, we can fly anywhere, we can, well, depending on your vaccination status, sorry about that, uh, you can fly most places, uh, America, like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, you can fly most places. You can go travel. You can see the whole world. You can watch a beautiful sunrise. And I walk around, and what do I see? I see people literally bowing down to a two-by-three-inch black box. Oh, you who judge. I, I do the same thing. I lost my phone on Friday. And yeah, I was with Jason. By the way, I found it. And I kind of said, like, maybe this is a good thing because I think I've looked at this thing too much. But it's amazing how small our world has become. Like, we take part in, like, this. You know, somebody said, like, the, uh, there's a new Lord of the Rings series out. And it's kind of a beautiful thing. I only watched the first episode. But it's like, it's really sad that most people are going to watch it through a screen that big. And it's like how small our imaginations have become. And the thing is, like our minds, our minds are as big as the things that we behold. They're as big as the things that we behold. And if we spend our time shrunk down to this, our imaginations, our joys, and our life is going to shrink. Because we were designed not to be shrunk, but to see the glorious world. Why do you think God made the universe like almost infinitely big. What do you think? Occam actually said this in like 10, 
in, in like a thousand years ago, before they had telescopes, before they knew the world was that big, he said the universe must be infinitely big to show the infinite glory of God. And why do you think God made it that big? It's because created in God's image, we were meant to behold this and so enlarge our own appetites and joys for all that God is. And so when Jesus saves us, invites us into the boat, we are to turn away from the ways to behold him and him being not just a man, but the infinite God draws us upward and inward to the infinite glories and joys that are as eternal as he is, as powerful as he is, as infinite and almighty as he is, as he is where he is God. And being God, being man, joins us to the infinite where all our joys can be found. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that we would see you as God today. If we aren't convinced the Bible teaches that, I just pray, Lord, that anyone out there hearing this would just read again, read again and see your word declaring again and again, Jesus is God. And in seeing you were God, we would not just get out of the ways, but we would behold you. And beholding you, our imaginations would be so large to this world that you've created, to you, to your goodness. And in looking at you, we could have joy, have joy and have it to the fullest. So I pray, Lord God, that our joy would be complete in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.